All right, we're in Revelation chapter 4, is that right? So we, well, we're about to start verse 4, uh, chapter 4. We ended chapter 3 last time as Jesus says, I'm going to knock on the door and come in and have dinner with peeps because he likes to eat. Amen. Amen. If it were potluck, we know it would be a Baptist dinner, but it doesn't say potluck. I grew up Baptist, I can say that. Any questions or comments about anything in Revelation so far? So is there a way I can give a two or three minute summary of Revelation in general or what we've covered so far? In general, overall. Overall. I think it would sound like this. Christians, it's becoming increasingly obvious that you're going to have to choose between loyalty to Jesus or loyalty to the state. The more you realize that, the more you realize you're going to have to come out of it. The more they realize it, the more they're going to persecute you. You've got to decide. If you choose right, you'll be rewarded. If you choose wrong, you won't. There's going to be punishment. So nothing will go ahead. So John the, John the prophet has spoken to the churches of Asia Minor. He has given both censure or critique and encouragement to the churches. He anticipates that all the churches will hear the message. We'll see at the very, very end of the document, John was very adamant that when this is passed around from church to church, they must not alter the message at all. They can't erase a few words. They can't make the church look better, and they can't add things. Can't touch the words of, he says, of this prophecy. And most people in the world, I just heard the other day, benefit of the doubt, they mean well. They say, doesn't it say somewhere you can't add to God's word? No, it doesn't say that. In Revelation, it says that for that particular prophetic message. Because the assumption is, again, this is going to the different churches of Asia Minor. Much like a mass email, that you would alter the email before you send it on to First Baptist or First Methodist or Second whatever. And like, no, no, don't touch it. Just forward it on to everybody. And that's the idea. Then chapter 4, things change a lot. So uh, in apocalyptic literature, as we talked about before in your handout a long time ago, there's apocalypses where they take a heavenly journey. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah? As far as we know, every church got every letter. At least that would be the intention. A good question. We wouldn't know who got it, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would suspect they did. I would suspect it worked. A prominent trade route? It was, at least, at least it was a route of travel. I don't remember how much of it was for a trade route, but I mean, they would have traded on it. But I don't know how prominent of a trade route it was, but it certainly was a route of the cities. Because you can look on geography and see that it's there would have been a common road that passed through. Right, and I think that that's also the trade route. Okay, I don't recall if that's a... I believe that that's what I'm saying. There you go. Well, maybe so, yeah. And so, uh, the apocalyptic literature, there's literature where the people go on a vision, uh, go, on a, go on a journey, and there are ones that don't go on a journey. So, so far, he's not gone on a journey. He's had a vision, as it were, of the risen Jesus. He's had a vision of it, like a dream state, that Jesus gives him a message, and he imagines these different churches in this incredibly symbolic, incredible wild language, and he gives a word from the Lord Jesus to write, and he's writing, right, 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 right. Then things change dramatically, because now he's going to actually go on a little journey, but it's still a vision. So in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, After this, um, I look, and look in heaven, an open door. And, of course, heaven means like sky, or in the heavenly realm, an open door. door opened up. And you must probably, this matters in a little bit, you must remember in the ancient world, they, did, they saw their cosmos. Now, this is a vision. It, it certainly is a vision, but we must remember when they picture the cosmos, the earth, they didn't think of the universe. It's very important that we not forget they had no, okay, we have no evidence that they conceived of anything like a universe or a galaxy or a solar system. There's no evidence of that. None. Stars were not individual balls of burning gas. They were not. They were things that light came from them, but they were stuck in a hard thing. They called a firmament. And so the Earth itself was like a disk, like an old school record. And then you had uh, a firmament, which was hard above it, and you had it down below, probably something circular, and it was on, the earth was on pillars, and there were cosmic creatures that, down here, like Leviathan, and then you had, uh, I've got blue in my office, you've got um, these little dots would be like uh, stars, or the sun, and 
based on Genesis, you had certain things way up high that were called the floodgates. They were from down below and up high. And when God would open them up, sorry, I need to get my uh, engineer back. I'm sorry, this is horrible. Doors don't do that. I know, I know. Forgive me, brother. So, but the water would fill up the earth to flood it. And then they would come down below. That's where rain came from. It didn't come from clouds. It came because God opened up like uh, doors where there were storehouses of water up here and water below. And in creation, as he separates land, it's to separate, and he says, it says this explicitly, separate uh, water from the land. So he separates sea from sea, water to water. And it seems to have been the case that in general, they still had this view for a long, 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 long time. So it's certainly possible that when John of Patmos is having a vision, he's visioning that the word, the word for heaven, and both in Hebrew and in Greek, can re, is the same word used for sky. Uhuronios in Greek, uhuronios. And um, so, so looking up in the heaven, or heavens, could mean what we, would, what we would call sky, or it could mean something like the heavenly realm. So it could be the case that John the Patmos imagines a door being opened, and he can see through. But the idea was, of course, when you see through this, up, what do you see up here high? Not just water, but what? You know, forgive me, God, but you see God. Because this is where all the angels are and the beings are. They're right up past the firmament. And, and there's some text, I don't know if it's in the biblical text, maybe a little bit, but there's some text that seem to suggest that even the stars themselves are like little puncture holes in the firmament. And so God's glory shines through, and that's where the light comes from. Uh, that's not exactly sure in the biblical text, but but God's up there. So if you if you got past the hard part, that's where He lives. And so could it very well be the case that when John thinks in Revelation four, he sees an open door that he sees, he's about to see into the heavenly throne room. Now he's going to, well, we would say, I'll say not. He hijacks. He borrows uh, on purpose direct vocabulary from from books, Jewish works, that everyone borrowed from all the time. And, and of course, this open door sees him. Well, I'll go there in just a second. He hears a, the first voice, that original angel. I heard a voice speaking to me like a trumpet. That's what I played, so I get it. So it's loud and authoritative. And it says, and I love this, but it sounds like a trumpet. In other words, he doesn't hear exact words. It sounds like a trumpet. Well, what did he sound like? Like a, like a bugle. A what? I'm telling you, I can't describe it. It's like a trumpet. Uh, and he says, come up here and I will show you what must soon take place after this. And he seems to be the case after these early, um, after this description of the Church of Asia Minor. Now, little footnote here, in dispensationalism, this verse is used to be, is interpreted as the church is being called up before tribulation. This is called rapture. Um, I find that overwhelmingly unconvincing. Uh, you might, I, anyway, in context, this has nothing to do with the church. He didn't say the church would come up, nothing. He says, John, John has a vision. He sees a door. He says, come up here. This is not about people leaving the earth. He's, it's in a vision. It's just a dream state. And he comes up, and he's about to go on a journey, which, again, fits many, many other apocalyptic works. And at once I was in the spirit, and in Jewish literature that always means, basically, in Christian means I had the spirit of prophecy. I was in the prophetic spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon me, and I came up, the spirit came on me. In the spirit, that's exactly what that means. And look, a throne stood in heaven, and one seated on the throne. We're like a, oh, we're supposed to hold our breath. Now this is, uh, of course, now he's about to model it a little bit on Isaiah 6, but chiefly from Ezekiel chapter 1, and then, of course, a little bit in Daniel 7. And so, so what we have in chapters 1 through 3, chapters 1 through 3 is this horrible church setting, basically. Like, man, it's rough. Y'all are doing bad. Then in chapter 4, all of a sudden, it's the glorious throne. Why shift from that to glorious throne? And chapter 5 is almost identical. 4 and 5 are almost identical. Talbert and others make the point, I think he's right, that he's setting up hope. He's about to let you know all that you're, I'm about to tell you about what's to soon take place in tribulation. It's going to sound horrible. It's going to be horrible. But don't forget, the one who is good and gracious and kind and loving on the throne is in control. It's going to look like all is coming undone, but it's not coming undone. This is all by the will of God. And so he sets up, and he does this throughout the whole revelation. He'll set up, and then he'll go and he'll set up. So he sets this opening scene up to encourage the people in chapter 4 to 5, and then he's going to tell the tribulation. 
And then there's an opening scene in chapter 8, verse 2 to 6 that encourages the people. And then he spends a few chapters of tribulation. Then he does it again, he does it again, does it again. Much like this, if I said there's good news and there's bad news, let me tell you the good news first. That's what this basically it seems to be the case. This, let me tell you the good news first. Now, the text in Ezekiel chapter 1, uh, some Jewish mystics, uh, they call the Merkaba is the Hebrew word for throne. So we call it Merkaba mysticism. And cer certain Jewish mystics said that Jewish boys shouldn't be uh, reading Ezekiel 1 to the 21 because they can't handle it. It will throw them in such an ecstatic state that they'll just go crazy or might even kill them. So you're supposed to limit. So while we, if we read this so quickly, like, you then I saw a throne, we must remember in the ancient world, they really are picturing the throne room of God who was in the heavenly, heavenly realm. And they picture God like everybody in the time period pictured ancient monarchs for kings. It's not a committee. It's not a republic like we have. It's not a democracy. It is a king. And every single king sits on a throne. Every single king has some kind of retinue or, or, or assembly. We might say like chief of staff. Um, every monarch has th beings, persons that serve the monarch. All of them do. And so Jews, like any ancient person really, Jews picture God just like an ancient monarch. Not just like, but my point is he has features. So he's on a throne, but no one really thinks God the Father, of course, is literally sitting on a throne. Not in Judaism, not in Christianity. Again, it's, it's a metaphor, a symbol for authority. But he sees his throne, God in his throne. And he wants someone seating on it. Now, it's one seated on it in chapter 4, but in chapter 5, it's the lamb seated on the throne. Which one is it? The answer is, uh-huh. I mean, it's, it's deliberately blending boundaries all through the text. Right now, it's one. And the, and the next verse is the only description of God in the whole vision. Uh, John spends more time focusing on describing the characters, the beings around the throne, than the throne itself, which, again, fits in Jewish theology. And so he describes the one who sat appeared like Jasper and Carnelian. So Jasper is a red color. Carnelian is like an orange, uh, orange red color. And so it's just a beautiful, beautiful jewel looking as if light was going through jewels. And around the throne was a rainbow and around it because everybody in the time period, Jews and Christians, like even synagogues, uh, if you went to a pagan temple, they either did a semicircle or a circle. So, of course, there's a circle around the throne. There's a rainbow. It looks like an emerald. It's like a green rainbow. And the rainbow, of course, in, in ancient Judaism represented what? What did the rainbow represent before the gaze took it? Hmm? Yeah, the promise of what? <clears throat> Never do it again. So, basically, mercy, right? Promise of mercy that I'm not going to do this. So, the picture, the first thing he sees of God is he's this resplendent, beautiful, jewel-like Oh my goodness, can you imagine how beautiful? And around his throne of authority is this image of a rainbow that is this, this promise of mercy. And so he starts with, the, of course, God. Uh, you might say God's in the middle. And then he's going to start describing oh, as he goes out. He's going to go, he's going to go um, outward. And where are we at? Verse 4. So around the throne were 24 thrones. So now we have other thrones. Uh, and of course, these are images of authority. Whoever these authority figures are, there's a bunch of them. There's 24. Scholars and church thinkers forever have said, well, who are the 24? Is it 12 times 12, meaning the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, meaning is it Jewish and Christian people of God? Maybe. Is it 24 they represent priests that represent people groups? Maybe. Is it more generic, such as the 24 uh, thrones, or he calls them elders, uh, 24 elders? Is it the elders simply like a divine council? Uh, I mean, to me, it's at minimum a divine council. This idea that whoever they represent, either they represent other beings, or they're just a divine council. We might say, well, I don't like, if you don't like the idea that God has a divine council, okay, it's all through the Bible. I mean, it's all through the Bible all through it. Uh, Old and New Testament, this idea that, again, that's how you picture God. He's an ancient monarch. And monarchs, of course, they have like a chief of staff. Now, what's interesting is, or what's another word of, not chief of staff, um, I always think for a while from that. Not a Supreme Court, but like if the president got a bunch, all his big dogs. Cabinet? What's that? Cabinet. His cabinet. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's better. Like a heavenly cabinet. His main, main guys. Now, what's interesting in the Bible, while other 
people talked about their gods having a cabinet, God doesn't refer to them for advice. They exist, but he doesn't bow down to them because, remember, he doesn't bow down to anyone. He doesn't take anyone's advice from him. He doesn't. But they're there. He just doesn't, he doesn't convene them to say, what do you think I ought to do? But they're there. For example, and I could spend a long time, and I won't. I won't get bogged down here. Uh, for example, in Job chapter 1, and, uh, and God's up there, and he's there with the sons of God or the minor gods, as it were. That's what that means in that, in that context. Basically, that's what every scholar thinks. And this one of the persons from his cabinet is his, he doesn't have a name. It doesn't have a name. It has a title. And its title is Ha Satan in Hebrew. Ha Satan, which means the accusing one. Satan is not his name. It's Ha Satan. The accusing one comes up and says, hey, I know God doesn't serve you, doesn't love you at all, unless you, he just loves you and is faithful because he's getting a bunch of junk. Take away this junk. He don't love you at all. Like, uh -uh. Yeah, let's see. Okay, you do whatever you want. Just don't touch him and you just don't kill him. We'll see if you're right. And that's what happens. And Ha Satan goes and does exactly what God says he could go do. So uh, Ha Satan is not an evil character in the Old Testament at all. He's just part of that divine assembly. He's part of that divine cabinet. Uh, but again, God never consults them, but they're there. And so there's different images of that throughout Judaism and Christianity. And here's one. So he's got 24, whoever these characters either they represent the 12 tribes of Israel and Christianity, or they're like priests, or they're just these divine assembly we don't know. I don't know. You can make up your own mind. But they're in white garments. And because they're in white, they might lean towards the idea more like that they represent priests, they represent the people of God. Maybe. Maybe. The, uh, and the golden crowns upon their head. And of course, they have crowns. And uh, guess what kind of crown it is? The Stephanos crown. So it's the Stephen crown. Stephanie, remember the Stephanos crown? Stephanos crown is the crown you have of a victor if you win a race, win the Olympics. Stephanos crown. These beings have crowns. Now these beings, so if I'm a Jew and I see these characters and they're around the throne of God, these aren't little minor characters. These are, whoever they represent, these are major, major figures in God's world in the, king, in, in the heavenly realm. And they're authoritative. Whoever these, what, whatever these elders are. Verse 5, the, from the throne, this sounds just like Exodus, sounds like Sinai, uh, back Exodus 16, uh, uh, 19, rather, 1916. From the throne flash lightning and voices and peals of thunder. That's exactly, if you read ahead a little bit in the sermon from last week in Exodus chapter 20, right, if you'll remember, if you, we didn't cover it because of time. We could have spent, we could have spent a long time, uh, which is okay. Um, the so-called Ten Sayings, Ten Commandments, the very first time they're announced by God, everybody can hear it. The idea is that the people from below could hear God speaking. Now, down low, it sounded like thunder. They can hear the thunder, it shakes the mountain, and they see lightning, and it freaks them out, scares them to death. And so it goes back and tells Moses, Moses, sounds all good, man, but next time, you do the talking, figure it out, and come tell us. The second time he tells them, he writes it on tablets. So the first time is like this public awareness. So this, and that's from, that's from uh, Exodus. So that's what goes on here, is that the idea is that it sounds like that. When God speaks, he, he sounds this authoritative, whatever it might sound like, uh, thunder. And that's what the voice of peal and thunder. And before the throne burned seven torches of fire, which again sounds like the menorah, which are the seven spirits of God. So that's the Holy Spirit, the perfect spirit. So around the throne of these elders and the Holy Spirit and this rainbow-looking uh, green aura. And before the throne there, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. Now that also could be a reference to maybe Zechariah 4, 2, and so forth. But it's possible, uh, I mean Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1, 22, because there's a sea before the in the temple. There's the idea there's water out there. It's possible that's just a reference to like a temple analogy. There's water out there. It's also possible that the sea of glass like crystal because the water is completely still. And that doesn't matter to us much these days. But in the ancient world, in the Mediterranean world, in the Mediterranean world, both Greeks and Romans, for which we have evidence, and certainly the Jews, when they thought of water, they thought of chaos because water typically is scary and you die there and it's dark and... Nobody likes water at nighttime kind of stuff. And so in the ancient world, in the Mediterranean world, they never, they rarely, rarely went across the sea. Say you went from Israel to Patmos, over to Italy, to the boot, to Rome. Instead, would, you could, but typically what people did, or the Alexandria, Egypt, were the, the bread basket of the world, typically you went around the coast. You never got that far. So if you looked out the coast, you would see boats everywhere because out there in the sea is dangerous. Poseidon, the Greek guy, you know, he's going to, kill you or bless you, you don't know, you never know if you're going to make it. And so the sea represented chaos. 
So it could be the case that this is another great metaphor that out before God's throne, I mean, how still is crystal? Right? It's absolutely still. That is to say, before God's throne, it's in complete, absolute calm and power. There's no chaos before his throne. It's compl- everything is as it should be. Everything. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, now we're getting closer to the throne now, are four living creatures. Four, four living creatures. Now, what's interesting is this is the only time it's referenced in the Bible, four living creatures like this. But what John's about to do is blend together two different common images of certain beings, which I'll talk about in a second. But these four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind, so seem to be they have complete awareness. And uh, the first living creature is like a lion, which is the strongest of the wild animals. The second living creature is like a donkey or an ox, and that's the the most well-known strongest of domestic animals. And then the third living creature, the, the face of a man, uh, of course, the, the the creature that we know, and that they would that creature that represents us. And the fourth living creature is like a flying eagle, which is like the strongest bird of the air. So these are almost indicative of the strength of all the different creatures that they would think about. But except you might not say the strongest fish, <laughs> the strong. We don't have every single thing there is, but these are four. Now, where do these come from? Well, these actually come from Ezekiel. If you go back and read Ezekiel chapter one, you'll see that Ezekiel sees beings like this. But in Z- Ezekiel, these creatures all have the same, they all have the four faces. But what John has done is split them up to where there's four different beings and each being has a different head or face. So he's, split, so he's using it, but he's changing it. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings. Well, that sounds like seraphim in Isaiah 6, which I'll, go, I'll talk more about that in just a second. Uh, so, let me see. Six wings are full of eyes all around within. So, they're, again, they have full awareness of things. And day and night, they never cease to sing. And I quote almost directly from Isaiah 6, 2. Holy, holy, holy. So, three times a charm <laughs> means three is absolute. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's a way of saying like he's eternal. And they're, of course, quoting Isaiah 6, verse 3, like I said. Now, here, and I'll keep going, I'll keep going. Um, And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, that's the who lives forever and ever, is like saying who was and is and is to come. Every time they hear the 24 elders fall down who is seated on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne. And hence the Christian band casting crowns. They didn't ask my opinion. I would have said that because I've heard that. Well, I mean, it's all. I've heard this in sermons. You know, I can't. One day I'm going to cast my crown down. The Bible never says I have a crown. Never says I'm going to cast my crown. It says 24 elders cast their crowns, which it gives a way of saying these chief, chief authority, cabinet, divine officials, whoever and who they be, they're nothing compared to God. They're they're cast. I mean, they're bowing homage to. They're showing homage to the real king. They don't have any independent authority. Only authority they have is given by God. And they throw it for the throne. And they say not, hey, wait a second, we're chief elders. They say, worthy are you. Our Lord and God, our boss, that's what Lord means, boss, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor. I allude to this, but it's worth repeating. I have. In Judaism, there is a hard line between God and and then all other creatures, all of them. I mean, it's just, I can't tell you how much is different. And there's a hard line. And the word they use to describe that quality of God that makes him God kind and not creature kind, in Hebrew is kadosh, but we, we translate that holy. That quality of God that makes him God and not creature kind. Only God is holy. Now... If something gets co-identified with God, it too can be holy. But that's only because it identifies with God. It's like if God were rain and it gets wet, now it's wet too. Now it's holy. It's not independently wet. It got rained on. So spoons, utensils can be holy. Altars can be holy. And of course, people can be holy. It's not a moral category. It's a category of God kind. 
In the Old Testament, uh, it was a big, big deal because God believed that if I, if you're deemed as holy, it's kind of like saying, bear, sorry, God, it's like saying, if I cared a lot about it, my son's name, he's Hayden Pendergrass, and as a Pendergrass, out in the world, you know, this old school, you, your name represents my family, and you can't make, embarrass my family because you're a Pendergrass, and what you do reflects on me. I don't think that whatsoever. But imagine if I did, it's like that with God in the Old Testament. When the Jews act a fool, it makes God look bad. And all the Old Testament we learn, God cares about himself. He, that is, he cares about his reputation. And every time they sin, it looks as if God is that way. And he does not like that at all. One of the reasons that makes, one of the things, one of the character traits that makes God God, thus holy, is the fact that only God creates. Only God creates. Only God creates. No other creature creates. That's a biggie. Another thing that makes God God is only God rules over everything. So like my image of God ruling over the, the he rules over everything. And only God judges. Now, God can delegate some of his rule to a creature. He can say, okay, I'll let you rule too. He can delegate some of his authority to judge. Okay, I'll, I'll let you judge too. On the rain, you'll, I'll let you get a little wet. But everybody always understands that he alone is the actual ruler. He alone is the actual judge. And that makes God very distinct from any other being possible. So Jews did not think, like Mormons do, you can just grow up to become God one day. That's against everything Jews believed and still believe. Christians, historically, have believed the exact same thing I just said. And we see things like that in texts like here in Revelation, where it says, that's what they're so happy about when they sing, you're worthy because why? You're the creator, and by your will all things came to be. Quick little footnote, something that's so, scholars have recognized for a long time, that's so amazing, really amazing, is that 1 Corinthians was written around probably A.D. 55. Probably around 85. So within, let's say Jesus died around 8030, which is about right. 8030 or 8033. Within 20 roughly years, 20, 23 years, the Apostle Paul can tell the Corinthians, and you can read 1 Corinthians 8, 6, that all came into being because it's by God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul puts Jesus, the guy they knew on earth who ate food and hung out with his disciples and preached about the kingdom of God, Paul puts as part of the creation, the creating act itself. No Jew ever talked that way about anybody. Moses didn't do that. Abra I mean, Moses. King David didn't do that. Abraham didn't do that. King Josiah, the second best king in Jewish history. But they did it to Jesus. Now, that's a fact because we can read what Paul said. Then the question is, why would Paul do that? That's a even if you're just a, you worship the devil, that's a good historical question. Why would a first century Jew, within two decades, say such an outrageous thing? Uh, and that's amazing. You have to come to grips with why would he say such a thing? Why would Paul, who used to go persecute them, now say he was part of the creative act? Uh, I mean, I think I know why he said that, but my point is that's an interesting historical question. So it is, and because only God creates. Okay, that's one thing. So God, he, he's creator. What about these creatures? Uh, quick little things about that. Uh, these four living creatures are almost certainly a blending of Ezekiel 1 and Isaiah 6. So there's two different kinds. I hope everybody can still hear me. Everybody can still hear me, hear me, hear me. If it keeps breaking, I can undo it. There's two different... There are spirit, I'll call them spiritual beings that live in the heavenly realm. And modern church parlance, they think everybody calls everything an angel. There's God, angels, humans. That's actually, that's false, and that's mistaken, that's not biblical. There's God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Then there are enormous spiritual beings. And some of those spiritual beings 
are angels. Angel simply means from the Greek word angelos, it just means messenger. That's all it means. So humans can be an angelos, they're a messenger. So that is, certain spiritual beings have a job description. Their job is to go, say, God said, go do this, and go tell them this, and he goes and tells them. That's it. Then there are certain spiritual beings uh, and different kinds of messengers. You have, and, and only two named ones that seem to be, I'm, I might say warrior too. Warrior slash warrior messenger, warrior angels. They kind of do both. By name, that's Mikael, Michael, and of course Gabriel. And then there are other beings called seraphs. The Greek, uh, the plural in Hebrew is seraphim. And then there are different spiritual beings called cherubim. And it seems to be the case that John here, back to blending together, it seems to be the case that John is blending together the seraphim and cherubim together. But they're different beings. They're described differently. The seraphim... Uh, it comes from a Hebrew word. It, well, we're not exactly sure where it comes from, but it comes from a Hebrew word probably that means um, it means something like to sting. Uh, a hot, hot as in like when you get stung by a snake, it burns. So oftentimes we call the seraphim the burning ones. The burning ones. That is to say, but, but basically what it means is they would have looked like a flying snake. They have wings. They have in Isaiah six. They have six wings, two for their eyes because they're in front of the they're in front of the throne of God and they can't see directly in His glory. They have two that cover His feet, but it probably means genitalia because they want to be ritually separate from God. And they have two, of course, to get them here and there. Uh, but these beings seem to act as uh, either guardians of the throne. Or that they're just there to, uh, or they're just there to sing. I, I, most scholars probably lean towards the they're there to pay homage, they're there to honor, because they they're there to face God before His throne all the time, and they say, "Holy, holy, holy, holy God." They're just there. Their job is to keep singing. And little footnote: people always say, "I know we're gonna in the world that we're made to worship," because in Revelation, that's all we do is worship God all the time. No, we don't. The seraphim do. We don't. The Bible never says we worship God all the time. And that's why and a lot of times pastors are worship. See, that's why we, you know, Chris Tomlin, you and I were made to worship. But no, we're not. I mean, we're, I don't, at least I would say, why do you think that? The Bible never says that. Jesus never said that. That's not from Revelation. It's not from Jesus. The seraphim, they praise. They say, holy, holy, holy. The cherubim, oh, and there are images of these snake-like figures with wings and other ancient cultures. And we also know the Jews liked it because they would do pictures of them in different paintings and whatnot. Then the cherubim. Today, in modern usage, a cherubim is a little chubby, fat baby, a white baby. They're always white. They're always Caucasian. And they're always overweight. And they're so cute, just resting on clouds. That's absolutely not biblical. The cherubim is a very ancient uh, creaturely concept that shows up all through the ancient world. The Babylonians did them, the Egyptians, I mean, almost everybody had them, and Jews are no different. They have different descriptions, but they do have some commonalities. They all have wings, they all have wings, and they're almost always used to protect. And so, because they're there to protect, they have very ominous figures. A very common image of the cherubim is a lion. And if you go to Babylon, you look up, you can just do Google search on cherubim, you'll see this. Uh, the cherubim are the figures on top of the Ark of the Covenant. You remember the Ark of the Covenant where it said, if you remember your Old Testament a little bit, he put the cherubim, they had the winged creatures. Those are winged creatures. Why are they doing that? Probably they're, they're their protection. So the cherubim show up a little more in Ezekiel. The seraphim show up in Isaiah. So the seraphim look like snakes. The cherubim look like living creatures. So it seems to be the case that John has melded these two characters, these two creatures to kind of together. So the seraphim are in Isaiah 6. Ezekiel 1 is the cherubim. Ezekiel chapter 1. That says easy one. That's my rapper name too. I don't know if you told that. I'm just kidding. I don't have a rapper name too. Just a joke. Just... My rap name is really clubbing for Jesus. It's not, it's not Ezekiel 1. Easy one. 
So, and then we have, maybe you know the being they show up. Any questions or comments about that at all? Well, it's not the first. I don't know if it's the first time mentioned that Paul Paul says that Jesus creates. It's just uh, in scholarship we think it, it's one of the most profound early references to Jesus in part of the creating act. If that makes sense. Is there a first reference before that? I don't know. The, the tricky thing with first references is knowing exactly when the letters were written, and we don't know. Some scholars think 1 Thessalonians was written first, around AD 51. Some think Galatians was written first. And so I might go to those and say certain things. I might go, well, but as far as creating, the creation, that is mentioning that exact act, this might be the first one. Uh, it's certainly an early, early, early one, if not the first one. Yeah. It's just my point wasn't that it was the first, but that it is extremely early. But it might be the very first. That's a great question. It really is. I'm serious, brother. Uh, did, did it kind of evolve over time? How did the Christians come up with it? Uh, scholars who study that exact topic, it was called, it's called Christology, of course, the theology of Christ's divinity. Uh, they part ways. Uh, people like Larry Hurtado, who just recently died, in fact, uh, is, was one of the world's leading scholars on that exact topic. I find his work very persuasive. I had him on my podcast a couple years ago, um, and he's great. He's written several, but he wrote... He wrote several books on that topic. His view and several others are that that the early Christology of Jesus being a divine part of what Richard Bauckham would call part of the divine identity. Jesus being part of the divine identity is very early. That it almost burst on the scene at earliest. So they would say, was where did that come from? Their response is because they, based on the evidence, the short story is, Hartardo would say, it seems to be the case that Earliest Christians felt compelled to do it. That is to say, they would be doing something wrong if they didn't do that. You might say, well, where did it come from? I think Hurtado would say is probably from our earliest religious experiences. That they really, in religious and moved by the Spirit, in visions and dreams and maybe a sense of inner certainty, that he's not just resurrected, but he has ascended. And to be ascended means, as they said in Psalm 110, to be seated at the right hand of power. And that if he see the right hand of the Father, then he's due worship. Well, there's the conundrum. If you do worship, we only worship God kind. God kind creates. Other scholars disagree on the little more skeptical side. They would say, no, 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 what happens over decades, they came to start believing that he must be creating as well because this the long development or, or somewhat long theological development. So my, my view is that I am convinced it happened very early. And I say very early, I mean, I think within a few years at latest, they were saying, guys, we really got to come to grips with this. That guy that was crucified under Pontius Pilate the prefect, that guy on, it was the middle of the day, remember, I was there. That same guy, we think, was actually part of the creation process itself. Uh, Jesus himself seemed not to have talked that way. You have some references in John's gospel, but that's another big issue as well. Um, but the evidence doesn't tell us exactly when they thought it and exactly how they came to the conclusion. And that's why scholars have to go back and forth on the data, if that makes sense. So we don't have a document where Paul says, Paul says, and here's when it first happened to occur to us that he's part of creating. But boy, is it early. What it certainly is not, and this is where I find, I mean, I'm all about being, I'm a skeptical person. I don't want to just swallow everything. But the people who say that happened by Council of Nicaea, and I mean, that's you hear like Bart Ehrman and other people in the, uh, da Vinci Code and stuff, he was not divine until 325. That is demonstrably false. I mean, I can't tell you how much that's false. It's demonstrable. I mean, the evidence is exactly opposite. So it did happen early. The question is, how did they come to that conclusion? It seems to be the case they really felt that it was true. Good question. So the councils themselves, the creeds they developed over time, most scholars, and that's where that was my, my PhD was in historical theology. So the short story in that is, uh, Yes, that the councils were attempting to articulate the, the different councils. Nicaea and Nicaea and Constantinople, that was on 325 and 381 that happened again. The one that won the day was the one of Nicaea and Constantinople and created 381. They were trying to articulate the way in which God the Father and God the Son are related. No one denied that Jesus was, quote, divine. It was, how do we articulate the vocabulary? Well, that sounded like they're one person, because no one believed that. Well, at least you weren't supposed to. They were one being, but not one person. So how do I say in such a way they're not saying they're just one? No, there's two. Well, not that much two. Now you're like diatheist. There's two gods. 
The Holy Spirit was, will appear to him later. It took about 100 years before they had more and more counsel to get around to him. Uh, but at first was, how do we articulate that in a way that demonstrates he is God kind? And they did that from, from the New Testament. That is, it, it was slow stream of thought. Um, and it, it really was spurned on by people in the church saying things that a lot of other bishops said that can't be true the way you're saying it, or your interpretation is going too far away. So we need to get together and figure out, at least we know it's not that, and it spawned them on. And there were certain big players, like a guy named Marcion. Uh, he influenced a lot of churches to say, there's no way the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. You had other people like, um, anyway, I'm going for a long time, they're different characters. So as these different bishops, Christians who would lead a church, they would teach and preach, and they would use their Bible. And then a bunch of other people would hear what they were preaching, go, no, no, you've gone too far. So it's not like you had a bunch of saint worshiping pagans in the church. They just interpret the Bible very differently. Unfortunately, when you read the early church fathers, they were mean when they talked to each other. I mean, they they weren't, come on now, we all, let's agree to disagree. No, no. I mean, they were, uh, woo. Um. So anyway, it was not, it was a way to, how do we articulate it well? Not, we just came to the awareness he's divine. I mean, that's, yeah, complete, complete false nonsense. Okay, anything about that? Anything else? I was going to say one last thing about, Elaine, you ready? Okay, real quickly, she's going to play something for her. Uh, I, I started a quartet when I was an undergraduate and toured around. Then I was in my PhD. I started a female trio and produced them and wrote songs for them. And then we traveled around and made several albums. Anyway, I just, I started a female trio. Yeah, I started it. By the time I went to the name Davette, and um, it's a long story. Uh, I, uh, so you didn't ask for this, I'm sorry, if you'll indulge me, just for a second, I thought it was kind of neat. It's two minutes, two minute, 25 something minute song. I wrote this song based on uh, Revelation 4.11. And it, I wrote it for the female trio, which you're gonna hear, and arranged, I wrote it and then produced it in the studio. And the, the idea of this song, the chords kind of go all over the place on purpose. I was trying to make it sound otherworldly, if that makes sense, that, that's the goal. So anyway, let's see, I, I couldn't get the Bluetooth, let's see if this works. Thank you for indulging me. Thank you. Well, amen. Good. I can email that too if you want, if you, that interests you at all. Uh, yeah, I used to 
practice when I taught them that in the stairwell at Baylor University. And boy, you would go up the stairwell. I mean, it, the students would come down the backpack like, okay, come on. Go. The door would open. I'm like, come on, come on. Sorry. <laughs> but boy, I, I love practicing it. So these authority figures are going down before God, throwing down the crowns. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy because you are creator of all things. There's no one else who, uh, who's worthy of anything at all. Any questions about chapter 4 at all before we move on? Okay. Chapter 5, almost the same thing happens again. And, in, and Talbert brings that out in his commentary, I thought, very well. It's on bottom page 26, top of 27, if you have it. But it, it's almost exactly the same. There's God's glory, and then he's going to talk about the Lamb, God the Father. Then the Lamb's glory. Then worship of God, worship of the Lamb. There's the first Him, first Him. Then there's a narrative, narrative, second hand. I mean, it's, he's deliberately modeled it after the same thing. Bottom page 26. I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within it. So the right hand is the one in authority. He sees God the Father as a scroll. And he sees it, it's written within and on the back. That's called an apostograph. In the ancient world, you didn't write on the back of scrolls unless you just had to. It, because the grains of the papyrus... They worked one direction, but if you uh, but if you you go on the backwards, it went vertical, the verso, and so it's harder to write. And so some manuscripts we have are like that for sure. It just typically was on the inside, but it happened so infrequently. We have a word for it: apostograph. Apostograph, of course, in the Greek means the back of your hand. Anyway, so the point is this: it's very full. It's full of information. This scroll is. Now it's sealed with seven seals. Now you roll a scroll up, you put a seal, a signet ring, you know, wax. You seal it. It means you can't get into it. Can anyone hear yours? By the way, any just to make sure. Sorry, no one's saying they can't. Okay, just make sure. Sorry, I think the Bluetooth just wants to go out every once in a while. Um, so it's sealed because you can't read it. And there's seven seals. So the idea is it's seven scrolls, almost like seven chapters, seven pages. Every time they roll a page, they seal it, do another one, seal it, another one, seal it, so. That probably is the idea. So this thing is a, a thick joker, as it were. You're you're, we're, we're probably supposed to see this as something like a last will and testament. Because in the ancient world, you can talk about God being sovereign over things in certain ways. He can preordain it. Some say he knows ahead of time. And sometimes they use images like this, of scrolls or will being unraveled and being read aloud. And so basically, as you read aloud this last will and testament, it puts into motion what God wants. So it's just a metaphorical way of saying God's about to do what he does. But the problem is, well, we'll see in a second, there's a problem. Verse 2, I saw a strong angel, right? He's strong, he's powerful, like Carl, but he says in a loud voice, authoritative, who's worthy? I can just picture him. All of a sudden, by the way, this is angel. So not, not a cherubim, not a seraphim. Uh, now this angel, all of a sudden, there's this angelic being. And of course, now this angel is speaking. Uh, and he says, you know, basically, raise your hand. Who's worthy to open the scroll and break its seal? seals? Anybody? It's worthy. It's moral worth. Moral worth. It's not their strength, or he would do it. And that's why John said that. It's a strong angel saying, I can't do it. I, I can pull in these seals all day long. If you're a nerd like me, it, it, it's like a Thor's hammer. It's not strength. You've got to be worthy to pick up the hammer. You've got to be worthy to pick up the hammer. And so the problem is, verse 3, and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth you hear that image? No being anywhere in John's worldview, anywhere, is able to open the scroll, look into it. And I was so happy. No, I wept much that no one was found worthy to open the scroll, look into it. I just lost it. Please, someone's got to tell us how, what God is going to do. Someone's got to let us see how God's going to un unravel the future. And he's weeping. No one's worthy. Of course, I love how John, John assumes he's not worthy either. He's assuming the same thing. I'm not worthy. Not, not, I can do it. Uh, verse 5, Then the, one of the elders said to me, this, what an image, all of a sudden, dude on the crown, and, hey, hey, look up, hey, don't cry. Look at here. The lion, look at that. He was expecting a lion. No, the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is probably a, in Genesis 49.9, it talks about a lion from the tribe of Judah. Jews by this time took that messianically. There'll be uh, someone, a king, that will be like the lion of the tribe of Judah. Of course, that means Jesus. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, which that comes from Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11, the, the, the Messiah will be from the line of David. He has conquered. 
Remember, conquered's a nikeo, so he's conquered. That means, of course, he's conquered being assimilated. He has beat temptation itself all the way to the point of death. So he can open the scroll and its seven seals. He conquered, Jesus, disobedience and suffering caused by sin, so he can open it up. Well, that, so can the hearers. That's the encouragement. If you're hearing this in the first century, that's what makes you worthy. It's not your strength. Because strength represents imperial power. Everyone knows strength in the time period. That's Rome. They're surrounded by strength all the time. Our army is going down the road. They see their banners all the time. It's not about strength. It's about being worthy to do it. And the way you get worthy is by conquering sin, temptation, and so forth. Well, the ears, here's, if, you, if you flash forward to verse 9, you'll see in a second. Uh, well, we'll go there in a second. Okay, I, I'll take my time. So Jesus is worthy because he died in the face of of the decision of disobedience. He died, whether I'm going to go all in or not, and he went all in, therefore he's worthy. And before, between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, so this image, all he's right in the midst by the throne. Uh, so he's right in front of the, I saw a lamb standing. All of a sudden there's a lamb, as though it had been slain. Of course that's crucifixion. So he sees a crucified Jesus with seven horns, as all lambs have, that have horns. Just joking, lambs don't have horns. But this, of course, horn represents power. He has seven horns, meaning he has complete power. And he has seven eyes, the complete knowledge. And he has seven spirits of God, the complete presence of the Spirit. So the eyes, are, are the eyes the Holy Spirit? Or does it mean he has complete knowledge and complete spirit? I don't know, maybe you do. Um, but he's a lamb. In certain Jewish apocalyptic works, they had images of a lamb with horns that ruled over the Gentile nations. So the lamb doesn't mean all oh, shucks, all oh, little baby sheep, man, all oh, little baby. No, it's another metaphor. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's the lamb he, with horns. He rules over. This being, this person, of course, is worthy and absolutely authoritative. Abs this is not some sheepish, little humble, whatever. This is a ruling person, and he has complete everything, complete authority, complete knowledge, complete Holy Spirit, and he went, and of course he sends it out to, the, to the, all the earth, uh, because Jesus has the authority of the Spirit to send out. He went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Only Jesus goes up and grabs that scroll. I got this, son. That's in the Greek, Jen. I got this, son. Okay. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Before it was God, the Father on the throne. Now they're bowing down to this person, this being, each holding. All of a sudden, they got a harp. Of course they do, because that's a reference like to the Old Testament temple where they have harps. And with golden bowls full of incense. And here John tells us what that means. It's a metaphor for the prayers of the saints. All of a sudden, we have this. John gives the, ins, uh, the insight that... Before the throne of God, he hears their prayers. They, these elders, these supreme, they represent the saints who are crying out to God, which is a way of saying, he hears you. Your prayers are right before the throne of God. Right before the throne of God. He hears everything going on. He's completely aware of these prayers. It's the prayers of the saints, the holy ones. Saint from the Latin word sanctus means was our word for holy. Uh, and it, in Roman Catholicism, you have to do a certain miracles and da-da-da to become a saint. That's not biblical at all. In the New Testament, all Christians are saints because all Christians are holy because all Christians have the Holy Spirit. And you've been branded, you've been marked by God, and only God is holy. So once he starts co-identifying with you, Sue, you're a saint, you're holy. Not because you're intrinsically holy, because he's holy through you, because of the Holy Spirit. And they're all called saints. We're all saints. All of us, if you're a Christian. Verse 9, they sang a new song. Remember in Exodus? Remember in Exodus 14? I'm sure you do. In Exodus 14, 3, after they've been delivered through the Yamsuf, the Sea of Reeds on the other side, the song of Deborah, they burst into a new song. They sang new songs and there's new deliverance. I got a, I got a song about like the heat here go. You don't know you're in living color from the 90s, and that's because you're not fully mature yet. I'm kidding. You know the song, you don't know the, the show in Living Color? I see that hand, sister. There's a guy who said, "I got a song, right? Like he, he, so he writes a new song. He has it's a very, very, very funny. 
when he shows, he writes these songs, they're all new, and so that's what happens, a new song, because now the, the guy, this being, has taken the scroll, and now it's time to sing a new song of deliverance. We're so excited. And he's singing, what are they singing? Worthy, one more time, worthy. Worthy you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed men and women for God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on earth. The priest and the Jewish mindset had access to God's presence. So Jesus has given his followers direct access to the presence of God. Where in Revelation 4, they sing God is worthy because he's the creator. And Revelation 5, they sing the lamb is worthy because he conquered through death and because he gives us, his followers, access to the presence of God. We become priests and we're going to reign. So he, he will delegate his, well, I've already erased it. He'll delegate his, our ability to rule. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many, many, many angels, numbering myriads of millions and millions of thousands of thousands. So if you're an ancient person, this is saying infinite. This is as many as you can conceive of. All of a sudden, he hears an, basically an infinite number of these angelic beings. And they're saying with one loud voice, can you imagine one loud voice, worthy is a lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Which sounds a little bit like 1 Chronicles 29, 11. But he is worthy to receive all these things. Wealth, wisdom, he gets everything. And I put some of that and on a Sunday morning before some of the songs we sing, that's on purpose. He alone is worthy of that. I didn't write a song for this one. I love you, Jesus. I just did one for the first one. Though they're both on the throne, I guess. So. And I heard, so they're bursting in together. It's funny and interesting in Revelation, every time you hear someone speak out there, basically they're singing. I like that, because I like to sing. I hope I can join in one day. I heard every creature in heaven on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all therein. Everyone joins in the chorus. To him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. One more time. To him who sits upon the throne, in Revelation 4, that's God, we would say God the Father, and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory might forever and ever. So you see how Revelation 4 and 5 are incredibly similar. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped him as well. Amen means something like, so be it. So it's, it's their way of saying this is appropriate. I'm with them. High five, I agree. So we have before the throne this amazing scene of God the Father who's glowing, this brilliance, amazing. Before him is a sea of glass. There's no chaos. We have these, like, it's a who's who of spiritual beings drawn from Ezekiel, from Isaiah, probably a little bit from Daniel as well. And he oh, eavesdropping this stuff. They're all saying worthy day and night. Holy, holy, holy. You deserve all that. And by the way, I also saw this lamb who was crucified and he comes up and grabs it. All of a sudden, there shows up this last will and testament out of God the Father's hand, his arm, though he doesn't have a hand, but an image he does, wink, wink, right? It's a vision. He grabs this thing, this will, and he says, I can, I'm worthy to unravel this joker. And they're so ecstatic all over creation. All of creation, basically, besides all the sinners of us on earth, they burst into song. You are worthy to, un, to tell us what's in the scroll. And then he unravels the scroll. I'll pause there because we're about to get to chapter 6. We're not there yet. Any questions or comments about 4 and 5? Anything else? I'm buying time. Anybody? Is this too fast? Diane, tell me. Is it too fast? Then you go back and say something else. Repeat it. Try a better job of explaining it. Anything? No? You feel me? So on your handout, I've just covered the vision of the throne, vision of the scroll, and destiny of the Lamb. The scroll of destiny, he calls it, and the Lamb. Now we're going to chapter 6, which is about to unpack um, seven seals. Anything there? Okay. So he encourages his audience 
God's on his throne, all is good. When hell breaks out, it's really not hell. <laughs> it's God unraveling things through tribulation. Okay, chapter 6, verse 1. Now I saw, then I saw, the lamb open one of the seven seals. He breaks the first one. All right? And I heard one of the four living creatures say, as with the voice of thunder, come. So one of these four living creatures, that this mixture of seraphim and cherubim, it speaks all of a sudden and says, come. I'm like, what? What come? What? I'll be looking around. And that's the idea. As he's looking around. What, what happened? And I saw, and behold, there's a white horse. And its rider had a bow named Jen. And a crown was given him. She likes horses. A crown was given to him because he's about to rule over. So he has authority. It's granted, right? So his crown's given. So God, apparently whomever, God gives him a crown. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, it's a different kind of conquer there. Uh, here, uh, this, it's evil. So this guy is conquest. He represents conquest and war. And, of course, it's supposed to because... And the Romans picture these white horses with archers on top with the Parthenian warriors. And they had attacked the Romans many times. So, so for his time period, he's evoking an image. They went, oh, there are the bad guys. But these guys are over. So they're thinking, oh, so now God is allowing conquering to happen on earth and warfare and warfare. Then he opened the second seal and I heard the second living creature say, come. And out came another horse, bright red. And sunburn, I'm kidding, its rider was permitted to take a piece from the earth so that men should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. So he represents probably anarchy and death, civil unrest. So the first one basically is war, the second one is anarchy. Anarchy, civil unrest. There's probably a band name in there somewhere, right? Is that right? The four horses, but also anarchy. Teenage years. Verse 5, he opened the third seal, he breaks it. I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I saw, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a balance in its hand. A balance, of course, uh, like you go to a marketplace back then. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures. It sounded it sound like a voice was saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, but don't harm oil and wine. Like, what? Well, a quart equals a, day, a, a day's wages. So basically, three quarts is one for one family. So one quart of wheat for denarius means you've got to work all day long to get one quart of wheat. But it takes three quarts to feed one famine. The point is, this is famine. This is famine. This is bad famine. He says, but don't harm the oil and wine. We won't kill them yet, but it's going to be tight. So one quart of wheat for denarius means it takes all day long to work to get just enough wheat for the day. I mean, this is bad news. And then he opened the fourth seal. He breaks the seal. I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I saw, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death. And Hades followed him. Death, of course, uh, the horse, but he brings with him the realm of the dead. That's the underworld, or Hades. Fallen. Uh -huh. What's that? Is Death, yeah, fourth. I mean, that's what most scholars, yeah, he's just, he represents Death. The third one was uh, Famine. Yeah, probably war, anarchy, famine, death. And he was given a power over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword and famine and pestilence by wild beasts on the earth. So this last one, he kills all kinds away. But only a fourth of the earth of the people, not everyone's not going to be killed just yet. Then he opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So pause for a second. All of a sudden, it's not, and then a horse came out. He's pausing. The fifth seal breaks, and then he sees all of a sudden under this heavenly altar, which is a good Jewish image, uh, before God's throne, there's an altar beneath that. All of a sudden, he sees, we would say, Christians who have been killed for the word of God. He doesn't mean the Bible, as usual. Like I said, it's not the Bible. He got killed for the Bible. They get killed because they're Christians. They mean the word of God is the gospel. So these are martyrs. So the assumption probably is the first four horsemen went out and killed Christians, too between famine and death and war and pestilence, Christians died as well. In the midst of that, they died just because they were Christians. And for the witness they had borne, so their, their testimony of the martyrs. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? Like, it. We were faithful and we got killed for it. Now they're right beneath the altar of God. They're right in God's presence. 
They're in God's presence. God's not like ignored them, but they want to be avenged. That's John's vision. Then they were each given a white robe and said, hush now until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. It's not time yet. Go back to sleep. Not really sleep, but it's not time yet. There's going to be other people who were killed for their testimony, which is one of the many reasons, again, why people say, Christians, we'll, we'll skip the tribulation. They, I don't think they've ever read Revelation. It's not time yet. More people will be killed because the Christian. It's not time yet. And that's a good Jewish apocalyptic way of saying God's got a timetable on it. So the fifth one, we don't know what the fifth seal yet. We don't know what's happening just yet. We just know that these people are going, uh, uh, well, what happened to the fifth seal is that he could hear a conversation, basically. That the people have been killed. People have, Christians have died. Verse 12, I opened the sixth seal and I looked. And behold, there was a great earthquake. But of course there was, right? There's always earthquake like in Joel Three, four, that's now we're getting big, big deal. The sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, it turns red. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. So we hear the stars fall down to the earth. Now, this is gonna happen again in chapter eight and in chapter twelve. To the earth. Which makes it very confusing if it means that this is all chronological which I don't think it is at all. I think Talbot's right. Remember, I think it's, he rewinds the tape, does it again. Rewinds the tape, does it again. Rewinds it. So, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. Verse 14. The sky vanished like a scroll. The sky is gone. And every mountain island was removed from its place. Every mountain on earth. Now, if the sky vanishes and rolls up, now what is visible? If you think like an ancient Jew, what's visible now? There's no more sky. What? The heavens, the heavenly realm. That's why I set you up a long time ago. Good job. What's now? There's no more firm and no sky. Oh, my goodness. It's like the big curtain's been taken back. And what do they see up there? Verse 15. The kings of the earth. And they all go, boo. Because they conquer the Israel, the Jews. Boo. And the great men and the generals and the rich and the strong. And everyone, slave and free. They hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. What mountains? They just said the mountains fell down. You see, if you push this literal, it becomes gibberish. All the mountains fell, and then they go hide in the mountains. Come on now. The point is, and I'll talk about it, it's just, it's going crazy. They call the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand before it? Who can stand before it? So everything's getting worse. So if you look at, uh, it, I'm going to erase this part. We're doing great. I wanted to finish this chapter. We're doing great. Good. The, the, the fifth seal, he doesn't... The fifth seal apparently gave him access to hear and see martyrs before God. The fifth seal seems to have given him access to hear, and, or, and rather us too, right? I'm the audience to hear how God's having a conversation with his martyrs. The fifth seal. Yeah. Oh, good question. So is there a difference here about martyrdom? Any difference with that in 2021 of people being martyred? So my response is no. There's, my response is there's no difference. If you'll remember, and I, I, I told you I'm going to come back to this, and you'll see this a good bit probably. I'm, I'm trying to. This is all time itself. So time had a beginning. This is the day of the Lord, JD, judgment day. This is the present evil age and apocalyptic eschatology that's ringing a bell a little bit on the first handout. Maybe, okay. Present evil age. And they said, no, 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 it's not going to be like this. A, a prophetic eschatology says it's going to be on earth. But then apocalyptic said, no, no, there's going to be a brand new heavens and earth. He's got to, you can't just give it a bath. He's got to start all over. And we'll talk a lot about that when we get to Revelation 21. But do you remember when I talked about this here and I said how it's going to get worse and worse and worse? Do you remember this part at all? 
and, and it's been worse and worse and worse, or then boom. And then this worse and worse and worse is given different names. Remember that? Called tribulation, huh? Birth pangs. That's right, birth pangs. That's exactly right. And then in Jewish apocalyptic, and I told you it tends to go from, might say kind of minor to major. So you'll have things like war. Let me, let me do it over here, sorry. So you'll have things like war, so humans hurting each other. And then it gets bigger in scope. Uh, you have things like, then you'll have like famine, and then uh, might say famine, pestilence, and then you get bigger and bigger and bigger. So anarchy all over the place. I'm not putting this in exact order, but something like that. Uh, then you have this broad death, and then it gets cosmic in scale. Then you start affecting the sun, the moon, you get earthquakes. I forgot to put that in there too. So it, it's getting worse in its severity. That's why it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. My view, and this, this is typical, a typical view among scholars is, again, what John is describing is this. So every seal is just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Did you notice the big shift between the fifth and sixth seal? And the sixth seal, all of a sudden it gets, we might, they would say the word maybe like more cosmic in scale. Before it's pestilence and famine. Now it's the sun gets darkened. The moon looks like blood. And for them, we've moved from, th they've moved from things on earth to now it's up here. So, you know, it's getting really bad. It's getting cosmic in scale. And it, the sky falls down. And all of a sudden they go like, oh my goodness, like the curtain's been, hide us, hide us from the throne of God because it's all judgment. So, so just repeating myself, Talbert's view is that this is exactly what's going on. And John is trying to, and he'll make this point six different ways. He'll keep, he'll keep talking about the same thing over and over and over and over. Let me say it this way. So if, if I were preaching a sermon, if I were John, and I didn't want to use apocalyptic vocabulary, I just want to preach the sermon, someone say, uh, or, or just having a conversation. We're at McDonald's having a conversation, and I'm John the, the prophet. And I go, John, man, did you read the paper lately? Yeah, things are bad. Did you watch the evening news? Yes, it's horrible. Why is this happening? Well, I tell you what, I know exactly what's going on. I was in the spirit the other day. God gave me a vision. And I'm telling you, these are all signs that the God's judgment's coming upon the earth. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, you know, look at all the wars going on in the world. Oh, yeah, I know wars. People dying left. Yeah, yeah, sickness, pandemic, absolutely. Christians being killed, absolutely. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. And then it all of a sudden gets better. So for John, his message is, now if you time travel and ask them the first century, if you said these kind of things like death and pestilence and war, they go, oh yeah, I, I know that. I mean, I know exactly what famine's like. Uh, we see this in the book of Acts. We see it all over the place. There's famine, oh yeah. John says, all these things you hear that hurt us, hurt us, famine, anarchy, whatever, these are all signs that God's last will and testament is being unraveled on the earth. It's not chaos it's not that God is not in control. This is all part of a, a plan that's leading up to Judgment Day. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And the general belief amongst John, it seems to be the case, that, and here I'm going with this, well then what do I do with this? What do I do with the fact that things are getting worse and worse and suffering keeps happening? John's view is going to be, and we'll see this, so hopefully you'll be okay if I keep repeating this, let it sink in. John's view is, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, remember X, X doesn't mean I love Satan. X is short for Christos, for Christian, like Xmas. Anyway, if you're a Christian, it means conquer, stay faithful. You stick in there. You're going to make it and be rewarded. If you're not a Christian, if you're everybody else, I'll just say evil, I'll say, you know, pagan, that's whatever word, Gentile, nations. It's their sign to repent. So what they should be doing, non-Christians should be experiencing these things and going, this is a sign that the end is almost here and I should put my faith in Jesus and knock my sinful life off. We'll see in Revelation, in John's view, that's precisely what they do not do. They do not do it. Non-Christians do not repent. They just fight back and they fight back and they fight back. While those who conquer are given white robes, they're being encouraged, they're going to make it, 
But everyone else just fights back and fights back and so much so it finally, finally builds and builds and builds to what people misunderstand as Armageddon. It, it builds where God the Father and then Jesus at different scenes or two different scenes. They come in and just kill all the bad guys because they just incessantly fight back. fight back. So in a nutshell, that seems to be what's going on here. Now, I'm, I'm not done yet. Hold on one second for your last questions. So that six seals, what about the seventh seal? The last seal. We're going to have it, baby. Because now we've gotten cosmic. The six seals, cosmic. There's nothing else to fall down. The sky, the sun, it's all done. Now remember, just to keep, make sure I hit this proverbial horse till it's, just to make sure. David, so the sun's going to fall down? Our star? That's about, you know, 300 million miles away? No. If stars literally hurt, hit the earth, the earth would absolutely burn to a crisp when it even got close to the earth. The radiation would burn off our atmosphere. It would instantaneously boil all the water. We would burn up in a crisp instantly. That's if just our star. So all the stars of the universe, he's not picturing any of that. This is not some literal description. In his view, the hard firmament has lights on it. They call We call stars. Asteroids, we get the word asteroid from that word, they fall down. They're not picturing balls of gas out in the galaxy. It's a cosmic vision of, of the firmament falling down. It's like everything just... Basically, it's an uncreation. Everything God set up and established is now being undone. Or another analogy is, it's like if you had a real good, nice stitch, and now it's becoming unraveled. The point is, it's not being unraveled on accident. It's not being unraveled because evil's doing it. It's being unraveled because God is doing it as a sign of judgment or tribulation. He's unraveling it on purpose. That's apocalyptic eschatology. It's not going to get better one day. It's going to be undone. It's so evil. And then John will make that point explicit that people are so evil. It doesn't need a bath. It doesn't need to fix a couple stitches. It's got to be undone. Christians are supposed to stick in there and go, I knew it was going to happen. John told me. And non-Christians are supposed to go, I give up, I'm so sorry. So they're supposed to say, I repent. But instead what they say is, hide me. Hide me. I don't want to look upon him. They should be saying, I give up, I'm so sorry. I'm a sinner. And the seventh seal, all of a sudden we think it'd be a very short letter, wouldn't it? If all of a sudden we get the seventh seal and we go, and then I saw new heavens and new earth. No, John's going to make you wait for it. What does he say in chapter 7, verse 1? Which I so wish it didn't say chapter 7, verse 1. It should be in chapter 6. We've got to get the seventh seal. Come on. Then I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth. So this is judgment. And it's still in the vision. And no wind might blow. And I'm going to stop there. So I'm going to stop because I've got to stop because of time. Because this it becomes a whole scene. Let me Just for fun, for now. Because there's a whole, it's supposed to build up suspense. What's the seventh seal? All of a sudden he's about to give this whole thing of reassurance one more time. Look in chapter 8, verse 1. Stay with me. Chapter 8, verse 1. And I, when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was, <gasps> drum roll, silence. In heaven, about half an hour. Tick tock, tick tock. No, no one pulled out the watch. The point is, for short, like, how anticlimactic is that? And then he says, I saw seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. What? The seventh seal is silence? It's a pause. I'm not ready, John says, to show you what happens on the seventh seal, nor is God. Then he's going to back up. Let's do it this way. Let's say instead of seven seals, the seven trumpets. We'll go all the way back, and basically it's the same kind of thing. It'll be earthquakes and famine, this and oh my and bears, and then the seventh trumpet is it. Just kidding, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to tell this whole excursus, a whole chapter or two, and then I'm going to tell you four agents of... I mean, if you look in your outline, that's what he does over and over and over. He makes you wait until all the way to the very end of chapter 20, almost 21, before he finally lets you hear what really happens in the seventh one. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not, I'm not going to skip over chapter 7 next week. We're going to, uh, well, not next week. Uh, I'm on vacation the next two Wednesdays. You can come. Uh, you Teach it, please. I, I'll, I was about to pick on Jen again. Uh, anybody else can teach it. Anybody else can teach it if you want. I won't be here. Uh, I might have to undo what you did, but you're feel free to. Jill's going to act that way. Jill, Jill, Jill just act that. Please, Jill. 
So next two Wednesdays, I will not be. I won't be here. But when we come back on the, whatever this 21st, I will do chapter 7. That's what we're talking about the the 144,000 before the throne and Jehovah's Witnesses love to talk that kind of stuff. I'll unpack that. But just don't forget, it's John's way of making you pause before the seventh seal and he's going to be some, give you something very comforting. It's that good news before, because man, all the earth is falling, falling down. It's horrible. And he says, hold on. And the seventh seal is just silence. And then he's whoop, starts the clock back up. Okay, let me pause there because I know we're out of time. Any questions? Let me ask this. And, 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 just shoot straight with me. Is this making more sense? Okay, I see some shake good nodding. I told you you're going to be a Revelation experts. Once you start getting to it, you're going to be experts. And I also told you this. I always have people go like, really? Because I'm not going to cover every verse. I'm going to say, I'm telling you. You'll get it. You'll be experts. You'll go, oh, I'm telling you. Because then we'll start doing so much. You'll go, we covered this before, right? There's earthquakes. There's this. I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. You'll do that. And that's good. I mean, I love Jesus and Scripture. I'm just saying that you can go look on your own. What I want to do is, uh, we'll do the seven seals, so it's chapter seven. We'll probably do the trumpets again, but then I'm going to skip ahead later on in a little more tricky spots. We'll talk about dragons, things like that in chapter 12. We'll kind of skip ahead uh, and look at some of the, if that's okay. Um, let's just go on. That's why I'm not doing this for a whole year, because you'll see, there's a, you'll see the patterns. Okay, any questions or comments? Anything at all? Yes, sir. So does John say these things basically to scare people into doing good, being good? There's probably some truth in that. There's probably some truth in that. I never thought of it that way before. I mean, you said that the I never thought of it that way before, like scaring people to, but there's a... Yeah, I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know the way around I'm saying yes to some degree because it is a, I think it's supposed to be frightful so that they repent. And we'll see some vocabulary like that later. I don't know the way around that. Yeah, I think there's a degree which that's true. Maybe almost a theological interpretation. Much like today, much like today, if I talk to a non-Christian about, I mean, do you feel happy when you watch the evening news? When you think about all the chaos going on in the world and all the wars and famine, does that mean, do you ever get scared? They might, I, think, I think a normal average person said, yeah, man, it's, it's a lot going on in the world. It's very unstable. And if I said, if I said to that, what do you do in response to that fear of those actual events taking place? I don't know if I would. I don't know if I would say you should be scared the blank out of you, but literally, uh, but <laughs> scare you to Jesus. But I might say, well, I understand that same fear too. But my hope is that you would see those things going on in the real world, things you hear about too, and you would use that as evidence to say, I need to get my life right. I think John would concur with that more than saying. I'm making up stuff. Like, I think they would really see the, the only thing they haven't seen yet in their time period was the sun, turn, that last cos, I'll call cosmic, the firmament one, the sun, the stars. So it's my view, and many people's view, that John deliberately gives examples of things, most of the seals, most of the trumpets, most of the bowls of wrath, most of them, they have experience. So like, all the way up to about number five, it's that six and seven they haven't got to yet. And so that, maybe in that sense, he's giving them a quote-unquote prediction of what's going to happen to scare them. Well, he might say, no, because it's going to happen, and it will scare them. <laughs> I'm not saying it to scare them. I'm just saying that. Uh, yeah, that's good. I think of it this way when I talk to people. You know, do you ever feel guilty? You think about, in that sense, that's an internal, that's a little different, but I say, do you feel guilty? Yeah, what do you do with that guilt? What do you do with that guilt? I mean, really about that. Do you, I mean, I, what I do, I drink it off. I sex it off. I drug it off. I deny it. I just go to therapy and hope I just feel better. And I, I mean, I'd say Greg Cole out of California says it well. He says, don't you all feel guilty? College came like, well, yeah. And I go, he said, is it in the realm of possibility? Is it just possible that you feel guilty because you are? Is it even just, and they all laugh, like giggle. I mean, what if you really are guilty and that's why you feel guilty? What do you do with that guilt? And I know what I do with it, which is I can't do anything by myself. I have to figure out a way to get that guilt assuaged 
And the only thing I've ever known that assuages that guilt is the truth of Christianity. Um, Santa Claus doesn't make me feel better. I you know, on, on, on. So I, to me, it's kind of like that with apocalyptic. That is, what do you do with all the... Um, Now, does that mean you have to believe that God sends every earthquake? I know Christians who think that. Every earthquake, they go to Revelation. Every earthquake, it's clearly an end sign at the time. Every time there's a war, I don't find that persuasive. I don't find that persuasive. I don't find it persuasive that John thought every earthquake is from God. But maybe he did. I just He doesn't say enough for me to find that persuasive in Revelation. It seems to me at minimum, or maybe maximum, at, that John is saying earthquakes, famines, wars, all these things are a sign of judgment day is almost here, and that it's not chaos from God's throne. This is all part of a divine timetable plan, and that we ought to get our act together. Yeah, and I, it, let me close only because I know we're past time, and I'll be happy to start ask questions, okay? In case people online might, might already turn me off. Let me say a quick prayer. We thank you, Lord Jesus, so much again for studying this difficult text. Please, Holy Spirit, help us walk out of here more devout, more courageous, more bold to be faithful to you no matter the cost. And God, that haunts me. Help us be bold. My goodness, help us tell the world who need to hear about you. Help us not waste any more time. And God, even in our own lives, help us not waste any more time. Whatever we've got to get right with you, help us get it right. To get sin out of our lives, to get nonsense out of our lives, to get refocused on you. And God, it is comforting to me, and I'm sure others, in this room and those watching and those listening as well, to know that you are on your throne. You're not shaken. You're not scared. Uh, you're fully aware of what's going on, and you listen to our prayers, and that if we have to wait between now and then to find out all the why, so be it. It was on purpose. It was not on accident. You're fully control of what's going on in the, as it were of the timetable of the events as they unfold the way you want them to unfold. We love you. Help, Lord Jesus, those of us tonight who are dealing with whatever struggle we might have, stress, worry, addictions, what it wounds from the past, present, whatever it is, God, help us lay them down at your feet, your worthy, worthy feet. You can handle everything, and your love is so much. Help us lay it down and pick up your peace, your hope, your joy. We love you. Thank you for loving us. For the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Yes, ma'am?